and is going to be on the screen. And if you have your Bible with you, at some point in the lesson, about halfway through maybe, we're going to have to read uh, uh, just a handful of scriptures. But if you want to go ahead and put, if you got a ribbon or something, or you want to leave your Bible open in Jeremiah 28, that's where we're going to be. Now, we are very glad that you're here. As Joey said, my dad's not here tonight. And the reason for that is uh, I have a baby due on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so whenever he decides to come, I'm going to try to be involved as much as I can. But I'm going to have to do that before anything else. And so we had our brother Joshua come in from Florida to this morning. And dad went to pick him up in Raleigh, Durham. And we got folk coming in from Texas tonight. And then we got some people, brethren, arriving from Arkansas tomorrow. So... Uh, different players are stretched out thin. But we're very glad that you're here tonight, and this night of the week is supposed to be the hottest evening. So this might be the shortest lesson that you hear all week. But it may not be. So just be, bear with us. Y'all know the song, When You're Looking for Your Freedom, Nobody Seems to Care? Right? Now I can't even remember the rest of it. You can't find the door, and you can't find it anywhere. There's nothing to believe in. People don't enjoy being religious. They don't enjoy being a Christian. And I have to say, for a number of people, it's because they're not a Christian. They're an American sectarian. They grew up with some type of man-made religion that did not come from the Bible. But as you see, I hope this is going to be a liberating sermon. There are a lot of new testament christians in the body of christ and they don't enjoy it and so tonight i hope that we can make some breakthroughs this is galatians 5 verses 1 and 13 these are very important scriptures for us to know now sometimes people have their own problems and they blame the church i can't do a thing about that some people they're going to good con they're members of good congregations they're getting sped, uh, fed a good spiritual diet, and they'll tell you, I ain't getting nothing. Well, that might just be them. But if you know yourself, and God knows you, and you say, I'm in a congregation, and I'm giving it my all, and I'm not being edified, that's a problem. In Galatians 5, verses number 1 and 13, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then he goes on in verse number 13, he says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, this liberty that's in Christ is very similar to the liberty that we enjoy in this country. Are you free? Yes. Are you free to just walk up inside of your neighbor's house anytime that you want to and open up their fridge and climb in their bed and change their TV channels? No. And in the body of Christ, we have to be very respectful of each other. And that's a big problem amongst Christians. Some are just outright disrespectful. And this is what they'll do with this passage. They'll say, well, I got liberty. And they'll trample all over you. No, that's not how liberty works in Christ. We do have freedom. And part of our freedom is the freedom to respect and serve one another as we both collectively serve Jesus Christ. Now, this is where I was the other night, and this is a background to our lessons throughout the Ten Meeting. Jeremiah 25, 11. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now, when I was up here two nights ago, the point I made was that in the Egyptian exodus, God punished the Egyptians because they were killing babies. When you look at why Israel went into Babylon, why Judah went into Babylon, they were killing their babies. And we said America is killing a lot of babies. So right off the bat, you know, I know that our money says one nation under God, and in God we trust, and I'm glad that our money says that, but our actions need to start matching our money. So Jeremiah 25, 11, he says, God's people, as we say, the Jews, were going to be sent to captivity 20, uh, 70 years. They were going to be punished. Now, this is, you say, this has nothing to do with what you just said. That's okay. Does your ma uh, preacher make you call him priest? Matthew 23, 9 and 10. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Now, some folk like to be called reverend, and they should not be. Psalm 100 and ver 111, verse number 9 says that title is reserved for God. 
But some people, they want to be called priests. Now, here's what you might say. If you are in tune with the sectarian community, you might say, why would I do that? I'm not an Anglican, and I'm not a Roman papist. They have priests. A bunch of other of these groups, they just call the, the teacher a pastor. But I've been to, uh, that's called the Anglican Church up here on Church Street in Uptown, and they would call that man their priest. You go over to St. Joe, kind of down Spruce, and they're going to call that man their priest. And you say, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm not an Anglican and I'm not a Roman papist. And here's my statement back to you. So you recognize that there are certain actions done by certain people. Only an Anglican, only a Roman Catholic is going to call their teacher a priest. Other people just don't do that. This is just some intro for us tonight. Can I get you to think about this? Are you going to a church that's pressing you to tithe on Sundays? Tithing, found in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10, in the same way that a person would say, no, I don't call my teacher a priest because I'm not an Anglican, I'm not a Roman Catholic. Then I don't understand why so many people today who would claim to be following the New Testament are taking their marching orders for information from information given to a certain type of people, the Jews. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be a room enough to receive it. This was given to the Hebrew nation. Now look at Psalm 150. That's by King David, a king of the Hebrews. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Again, this is a Hebrew writing to other Hebrews. And if we all agreed a moment ago that certain people do certain actions, this is something that Hebrews do. But inside of your New Testament text, you will not find Christians being told to tithe. You won't find where they do tithe. And you won't find where they're commanded to use instrumental music in their worship or that they even give us the example of it. Let's take a second. I'm doing everybody a favor here, right? Because your pastor, your priest, is hounding you for money all the time. So it's good for you to know this information so that you know your rights and your liberties. Now, this is just a starter. Because I want it to be bouncing around in your head. Are there some things that maybe we should not be doing? Are there some things that we're doing in today's community that were not even written for us? So that I can get you to think about this. Can you tell what that is? Chin, that's a priest collar. These men walk around, and they've got a collar, and they are trying their hardest to convince you that that means holy living. Do you know what really is the best representative of holy living? Holy living. Be a good person, right? It ain't no joke. Just be a good person. You ain't got to wear a collar. I've seen the uh, Disciples of Christ preacher. He's been gone for several years. He always wore cross earrings. Why don't you just behave yourself? And we'll have an idea that maybe you're a follower of Jesus rather than you've got to wear cross earrings. But this is my point tonight. When Judah, the Old Testament Hebrews, were going into Babylon, their priests were the problem. And today, the religious sectarian teachers are the problem. And we're going to document that tonight. Look at this. Who was Jesus' number one opponent? Now, we all know this. We hear it on a regular basis. Somebody gets called a Pharisee. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. A young man went to seminary. He went to a religious college. And he asked one of his professors, he said, if Jesus were here today, right now, he said, what do you think would happen to him? And the seminary professor, he said, if Jesus were here today, he'd be put in prison or he would be killed. And the student said, who do you think would kill him? And the seminary professor said, all of the pastors would kill Jesus if he were here. Why? John chapter 3, if Jesus were here, he would be making light, showing light on the dark acts of all the clergy. Why, why is it that they do that? You come to church on a Sunday and you see, you come in the parking lot, and what do you find? Reserved for the clergy. What are you? Well, according to the clergy, you're just lay people. What's that mean? Average Joe, don't mean nothing. Take them, leave them. But there's the clergy, there are the pastors, there are the priests. They call them men of the cloth. 
But when I look back in my New Testament, those type of people were Jesus' biggest opponents. Matthew 20, 13. Woe unto the scribes, the Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for neither go in yourselves, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. The people who should be dedicated to giving the truth are often the people who tell you, when you have a Bible question, they say, you don't have to worry about that. Why are we talking about that? that that's not really that important. Why can't they just give you an answer if that's their number one job? Luke 20, verse number 46, Beware the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and in the highest seats in the synagogues and in the chief rooms and the feasts. Just like, where is it? The highest seats. Last night, Dad said, high seats. He said, well, why are you on an elevated stage? Well, we just got to be up here so that we're visible on this Bible program. You know, I don't know how it is the case that our neighbors can't just see this. The robes, you look out at the pastors in the community, these sectarian pastors, they always got a big sash that says pastor or reverend. They got long robes, they got the collar, some of them got big hats. And what's that to do? To distinguish them from you, the person in the pew. And they love it that way. They love to be seen. Who aren't we to be looking at? Jesus. That is the image that we should be conforming to. Now I have to pause for a second. You know, my brethren in the body of Christ, they, don't, they won't do it. They won't ever call the preacher reverend. And they won't call the preacher pastor unless he is in the eldership. But do you know what they will do? They will give him way too much attention. And they will give him way too much honor and just prestige. And someone might say, well, I would have figured you would have liked that. I don't like that. I, I like being one of you. Why? I don't remember. I think it was one of us from uh, one of the guys from Maryland. We were talking about, you know, what happens when uh, the preacher does something bad? You fire the preacher. What happens when the membership does something bad? Well, we need to be forgiving to them. You can't fire a member. Jesus' number one opponent were the people who were gunning for these chief seats where Jesus just went out amongst the people. Who's Jesus' average disciple? The average person. David, therefore, himself calls him Lord. And when it, whence then is his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Now, again, this is where I have to say thank you for being here. This is a new tent top, and we do have new poles. And some of these lights are new, and we got a whole new setup down here. This is a lot of new stuff. But somebody says, it's still hot, right? I know you got a lot of new stuff, but it's still hot. Can I tell you something? I went to a Baptist tent meeting once, and they had a giant tent, and they had an air conditioner. The air conditioner was broken. So, great, you know, we could have an air conditioner be broken. Common folk who want to mix with other common folk, and, you know, even when the apostles received the gift of the Holy Ghost, or they received baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they had miraculous knowledge, who did they associate with themselves with? Common people. So even if we have Christians and they become very, very educated, good for them. You still got to be around the common people and you got to be happy about it. Why? Because that's who Jesus is happy to be around. Now, in your Bible, this is Isaiah. We've been making a big point, several big points in this uh, series of sermons in this meeting. Members of the body of Christ, we love the Old Testament. There's valuable lessons to be had back there, but I will have to say this now. One of the lessons is, if I look at my Old Testament and I see how regularly the teachers, the priests, and some of their who they call prophets, they were corrupted. I should stop having this idea that everybody who comes down the road and says they are a pastor of some ministry, that that means anything. And I'm saying, you know, we go door knocking, we say, we'd like you to come out to the meeting. I have had so many people on the doorstep say, yeah, I'm thinking about getting in ministry. Okay. I still would like you to come out. It's just this idea like they wear it as a badge. Look at this. Isaiah 28, 7. They also have erred through wine and through strong drink and are out of the way. The priests and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Now, this passage by itself, Isaiah 28, verse number 7, should give us pause 
when we have sectarian teachers in the community who are promoting social drinking. This, it says, part of their reasoning for why they erred from the correct way was because they were consuming strong drink. Now, I want to be gracious. Does everybody remember the point Dad was making last night? That Lot's daughters got him drunk. And some people might say, well, I don't even know how that circumstance is even ar that arose. He just lost his home. He just lost all of his livelihood. And he just lost some of his family members. Am I advocating that when we have hard times we drink? No. But when I see someone absolutely break down in their hardship, I'm not going to condemn that person for being human. Did it help him out any? No. <laughs> it didn't help him out any. So we might take that lesson from it. He ended up getting into more trouble. But this is the thing, y'all, and that's how Matthew chapter 7 works. You might say, well, I just don't know that I really like that point that he just made. Well, you know what? You talk to me when you lose your wife, when you lose your house, when you lose your job, and you lose your son-in-laws, and you come back and say, Caleb, I'm steady as a rock. God bless you for being steady as a rock. But that's what they were doing. Now, I have to make a point here. Someone says, well, you know, you're saying that about Lot. Lot wasn't your casual drunk, was he? No. But you find a lot of sectarian preachers. There are these guys out in Arizona. They can't sit down and have Bible study without drinking beer. That makes no sense. This is the time when I need to have the clearest level head. And what are they doing? How about we have a cold one? How about I just remove myself from this whole scene because we're not going to be having much sense anyways. Now, that's Isaiah 28, but here's Jeremiah 2. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and they walked after things that do not profit. Look. Not everything that's done in the name of religion has value. And you're going to find, and I'm saying, y'all, religious degrees don't have much value. You can understand your Bible without going to seminary. And when you start going into the sectarian world, they're going to try to rope you into a whole bunch of stuff that has no value. Where, they didn't ask, where's the law or the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. Now, do they claim that they're teaching the Bible? They claim that. But here, this text is saying that people who claim to handle the law can actually have no knowledge of God. How are you going to know that? We've got to start asking questions. Now, I met someone today, and they were a member at Forest Hills Presbyterian Church here in Martinsville. And when they started talking to me, they said, there are two types of Presbyterians in America. There's the Presbyterian USA, and that's what she was. She said, Presbyterians USA have lost their mind. And I said, how come? And I already agree <laughs> before I even asked how come. But I said, how come? And she said, they sent us a memo in 2018 that said if two homosexual men wanted to get married in our building, we had to do it. And she said, and you know, when they sent that memo, some people didn't like it. And one man, she said, one man led a split through the whole congregation, took more than half the people away. And I told her, I said, uh, I'm not going to marry two men. And I said, I have the credentials to marry somebody. I said, I'm not going to marry two men. She said, fine, good, that's your right. She said, you shouldn't have to do it. And she said, my point is, if they had not sent that memo, we wouldn't have been fighting about it. She said, because we don't have people getting married in our building anyway. And then she turned off that, and I said, hey, you're right. They shouldn't have been sending you a memo from wherever they are to Martinsville, Virginia, across the nation. She said, it's ridiculous. And then she said, they send us a book every year. And she said, I said to one of my friends in the Presbyterian Church, she said, you're telling me you read that book that they send us that ain't the Bible? And the person said, no. And she said, I don't either. And I said, well, why don't you get rid, <laughs> why don't you get rid of it? And she said, I'm fine to get rid of it. I said, a bunch of folk who don't read it want to keep it for some reason. She said, I know. But here's the thing. Again, I'm door knocking with the brethren from Maryland. And when I get off the step and I get with them and I tell them that whole story, one of them says, she doesn't have a problem that they got a woman preacher? Right there on their sign says, Reverend Cheryl such and such. Now someone might say, well, what difference does that make? You got your Bible? Look at 1 Corinthians 14. 34. He said, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. 
Now, anybody could look at that and say, well, why not? Do you know what the problem they're having over at Forest Hills? Some people are wanting two men to marry, and some are not. And what someone needs to say is, why not? Why can't the two men marry? And then somebody says, because the Bible says marriage is for a man and a woman. Okay, the Bible also says that women don't get to preach in the church. Now, why is she not having a problem with that? Honestly, maybe she just hasn't considered, maybe she's never read 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 34. But here's my point also. Why isn't her teacher, why isn't anybody inside of the Presbyterian group showing people 1 Corinthians 14, 34? Here's another one, Ezekiel 22, 26. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from the Sabbaths, and I, and I am profaned among them. Again, as we said, not everything that's done in the name of religion has profit, as the text said a moment ago. You can't just call something church and then just say, now it's holy. God recognizes what he asked for through Scripture and what we just come up with. I can't ever remember what Alan Preston's church is called, but they had NFL Sunday, where everybody came in wearing their favorite jersey. Why can't we separate holy and profane? And you have your jerseys after we worship God. And it's everything people can think of. Praise teams. We want to show the little kids. We want to have kids come up and dance. I don't know why they're doing that anyway. But there is this idea that we have to reserve time for God for it to be holy and reverential. And if you want to get together and visit, do that on your own time. But now let's make this point. They didn't separate the holy from the common, the common from the uncommon, and the clean from the unclean. And this is what somebody's going to say. Well, that's okay, because God is very gracious. And so though some people are mixing holy and profane, and they're mixing clean and unclean, they say, I don't really think it's going to be that big of a deal. They have a woman preacher, and they're violating the scripture. It's not going to be that big a deal. Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-six. Here's Ezekiel 44, 23. What did God expect them to do? They shall teach my people the difference between holy and profane and cause them to discern between unclean and the clean. It was not this case that God was sending them a prophet just to say, it's no big deal. And at the end of the day, I'm just going to overlook everything. He sent them a prophet to say, you need to do better. And in the religious community, can I go back to what we said at the beginning? Are people having a good time? <laughs> And here's what I mean. Someone says, are they having a good time in religion? Yeah, they go down there and they play bingo. Of course they're having a good time. No, I'm saying, do they have value in their Bible study? Are they being educated to be better people? And are they being good to their neighbor? You know, I talked to someone else today, and they said they had an older friend of theirs that said this, church problems begin at choir practice. Why is that? She said that's when all of the congregational gossips get together and got nothing else to do, and in between the breaks and the songs, they're all just chirping at each other. They're complaining about this, they're complaining about that, and someone says, well, what are we going to do about it? And then someone says, I'll go talk to the reverend about it. At choir practice. We've got to do better, and I've got to make this point, y'all. God is calling us, when you look at passages like Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 13 and 14. Sometimes you will have brethren come to you and, you'll, and they'll tell you, you know, brother so-and-so did this and I just don't know how I feel about it. There's nothing wrong with you making a case for your brother. Well, maybe they did this because they've had this going on throughout the day. Maybe they are just having a bad day. Maybe they've got some reasons why they're not getting enough sleep. You know, I do know this person, and they just had to take on a whole other job to make ends meet. So maybe you caught them at a bad time. We've got to do better, and people aren't receiving that type of education in the sex, and they have no reason to. But the idea of the prophet is to come in and help people do better, not just to say, well, God's going to give us grace, and I think he is gracious, but at the end of the day, we do have to clean up our practices. Now, I've been very, very generic and very, very vague, Till we have come to this point. If I can show you in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and I could do it in a lot of other passages, where teachers were called the problem, 
Why can we not do that today? Why can I not take someone like John MacArthur, Vadi Bakum, the entirety of the Watchtower Society, Jehovah Witness denomination, Charles Stanley, David Platt, R.C. Sproul, Joel Olstein, Stephen Furtick, Billy Graham. Now, we got all these sects inside of America, and it doesn't really seem to be taken with the people. We've had someone go door knocking with us recently, and they got someone who came to the door, and the person said, I've got my own church. And then the, the brother door knocking, he said, oh, well, can I talk to you a moment about this thing that pertains to Jesus? And said, get out of here. People are not enjoying their religion, and their religion is not profiting them. Now, at some point, I have to ask, is the problem coming from somewhere from the teachers? Now, this man, this man, this man, that man are all saying the same thing. If you're bad, you can't help it. That man, Joel Olstein, Stephen Furtick, Billy Graham, Charles Stanley, they're saying, if you are bad, it don't matter, because you're once saved, always saved. See how we have teachers who are just enabling the misbehavior of the people? Now, here's Jeremiah 29, and before we do that, this is the moment. Let's all get our Bibles out, and let's look for a moment at Jeremiah 28. People, and that, look, how about we do it this way? In the last month, in the last month, who has read the book of Jeremiah? That's good. Really, good for you. I'm glad for all y'all. Thank you. Well, under the tent, there was only a handful of people, a very small number of people, and that's okay. My point is, these are not commonly read texts. If you have your Bible... Look at Jeremiah 28, and let's start at verse number 5 together. And what I can do is I will put it on the screen in case you did not bring your Bible tonight. Let's look at Jeremiah 28, verse number 5. Now, look at what it says. The prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of all the priests and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels in the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in your ears and the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of a pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace... When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he brake it. Verse number 10. Now here's verse number 11. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people saying, Thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon from the neck of the nations with the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. We looked at Jeremiah 25, 11. How long did Jeremiah say they would be gone in Babylon? Seventy years. What did Hannah and I tell the people? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to go away. But it's only going to be two years. Now, let's go back here. Do you see how in that text that was an outright contradiction? Jeremiah is the real prophet of God, and he said 70 years. But another man got up. He said, now, I am a prophet, and I am saying it's only two years. I don't really need quotes from any of those people that we had on the screen. I'm just going to ask you. You think about it in your head. And it's going to be somewhat based on what you've been taught. Does a person need to be baptized in order to be saved? If you go to just, I'd say, any of these sectarian groups and you ask them, do I need to be immersed in water in order to be saved, to have my past sins taken away, they will tell you no. And you might be saying right now, well, that's just your say-so. Go ask them. I want you to go ask them. Now, you know, and you're seeing it here, and if you've got your Bible, you can look at it in your Bible. Does a person need to be baptized in order to be saved? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, that's Jesus talking. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. This is where somebody says, well, I know somewhere in the New Testament it just says so long as you believe you'll be saved no matter what. Do you see how I'm putting a book, that's the book of Mark, 
and I'm giving you a chapter, chapter 16, and I'm giving you a verse, verse number 16. You have to give me a book, chapter, and a verse that says, just believe and you'll be saved no matter what. And when you go and you ask your pastor and he says that to you, no, 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 you ain't got to be baptized, just believe and you'll be saved no matter what. Ask him for a book, chapter, and a verse. Now, let's do another one. Let's go back. Let's not do 1 Corinthians 14. Let's do 1 Timothy chapter 2. You go to anything. You go to Presbyterian, Anglican, Lutheran, Apostolic, Pentecostal. You might be co-op Baptist. Look at this. 1 Timothy, that's the book, chapter 2, verse 11 and verse number 12. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, Jeremiah 25, 11, Jeremiah said 70 years. Jeremiah 28, Hananiah said two years. <laughs> Do you have your Bible? Look back at Jeremiah 28. Look what happens to Hananiah. Jeremiah goes his way. Verse number 12. Then the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah the prophet after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, and they may serve Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah. The Lord has not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from the face of this earth. This year shalt thou die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hanani the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Now, I read my text, and I recognize what happened to the individual who openly opposed God, and he told the people, rebellious lies against the Lord. That's why I am very dedicated to sticking with the Bible. And somebody says, well, it's just up to your interpretation. How is it the case that nobody was saying that to Jeremiah and Hananiah? Jeremiah said 70 years and nobody said, well, that's just your interpretation. Because we're interpreting 70 to be two, which no one would ever do. And any intelligent person if it weren't for their tradition, would look at Mark 16, 16, any intelligent person without sectarian tradition would look at that and just say, if you want to be saved, you have to be baptized and believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, we could do this all night, and I want to do just one more. You know, we started out by asking the question, do you have instrumental music where you go and you worship? I want to make a point as we look at this. Someone might say, it shouldn't matter if we're worshiping with an instrument or not. Do you know the instrument does divide religious people? In 1906, a sect was created called the Christian Church in 1906. They wanted themselves to be titled that way, and in the 30s to the 50s, primarily in the 50s, a group split off from them, and they called themselves the Christian Church, parentheses, Disciples of Christ. But remember a moment ago how I said there were two branches of Presbyterians in America? There's the Presbyterians USA, and then there's Presbyterians America. Presbyterians America are not promoting of using instrumental music, and it divides them. Different types of Baptists. Primitive Baptists don't use it often. German Baptists wouldn't use it. It's out there, but look at this in Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Any intelligent person who wasn't bringing tradition with them would look at that and say, the direct command from God is for us to have singing. He didn't command that we have instrumental music there, but it's a thing that divides us. And I'm simply asking us tonight, why can we get so much information from our Old Testament text that that's how they treated false teachers? They pressed them and they questioned them. But today, we can't do this with anybody lest they call us rude. Well, I tell you who's rude, who is rude. You start actually voicing your disagreement with these people and see how they treat you. Disciples of Christ, I was invited to a senior citizen's Bible study, and it doesn't matter that they're senior citizens. Someone says, well, these some sweet little old folk, blah, blah, blah. No, they called the police on me just like any millennial does. And I had been personally invited over there. But now here's Jeremiah 29. Look how a corrupt priesthood treats you when you disagree with them. Because they have committed villainy in Israel 
and committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken lying words in my name. It is a big deal to teach false doctrine and call it God's religion. They have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Even I know and am witness, saith the Lord. Now look at verse number 26. This is what they say back to Jeremiah. The Lord hath made thee priest in the stead of Jehoiada the priest, that ye should be officers in the house of the Lord. For every man that is mad and makes himself a prophet, that thou shouldest put him in prison and in the stocks. Anybody who disagrees with us, what are we going to do to him? We're going to arrest him. We're going to put him in jail. When I go over to the Episcopalians, you know what they did? They called the police on me. Why? I went over on Ash Wednesday, which is a Roman holiday, and I asked them, why are y'all doing Roman practices when you're the Church of England? Called the police on me. And I am so frequent with the police that when the police got there, they said, how are you doing, Caleb? Do y'all have the police knowing your name? You may say yes, but not for religious reasons. But they knew my name. And they knew what was going on. They saw me on the city sidewalk. They told the Episcopalian priest, they said, Caleb is on a city sidewalk. That's public property. There's nothing you can do about it. I go to Uptown Methodist. I'm on public property on the city sidewalk. Keith Ritchie, who's no longer there, he came out. I asked him. Look at what it says here. They have committed adultery with their neighbor's wife. Keith Ritchie was scheduled to go salsa dancing with another man's wife. And I asked him, I said, is that not lasciviousness, according to Galatians 5.19? And his answer was, the police have been called, and they are on their way. I guarantee you, you press any of these teachers, they will have you removed from their assembly. Tonight, we'll have a microphone set up for you to ask a question. If you're a visitor and you disagree, well, someone says we're going to give them a microphone, but we got 911 on standby. No! We're just going to have the Bible program up, and you can ask a question. Now... I want to be very, very honest with you. Someone says, Caleb, I hear what you're saying. Why don't you have more to do with congregations of your brethren across America? I have brethren across America, and they are attempting to turn the body of Christ into a sectarian group. And they call the police on me as much as any Baptist, Methodist, or Episcopalian does. So maybe you're not from around here. And you say, I understand what y'all are trying to do. You say, the Church of Christ. It's not a sectarian title. I'm a Christian. Jesus died to purchase a church. I'm a member in it. We have brethren here. You know, that sign uh, out there, it says the Church of Christ. We have brethren uh, uh, here tonight. They have a sign that says the body of Christ. It's the same thing. It is the blood-bought entity of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. But what does that have to do with the Southern Baptist sect? What does that have to do with the United Methodist sect that is dividing right now over homosexuality because they want homosexuals to be in the ministry? Here's my point, y'all. You go traveling across America, you're going to find some buildings that have Church of Christ on the sign. And you're going to go in there and you're going to say, what are y'all? And they're going to say, oh, we're just Christians only. I don't have much to do with them because they would like to be my priest. They want to try to be my bishop. They want to try to be my pope. They want to take away the liberty that I have in Christ. What do I mean by that? They want me to fit inside of their cookie cutter mold. Whatever school they went to, whoever their favorite preacher is, you know what? God probably loves their favorite preacher. He's probably a good man. But sometimes they take it a step further and they turn it into something else that the teacher had no intention of. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption of whom a man is overcome, the same is brought into bondage. You know, I have brethren in Christ who will ask me, what do you think about preacher so-and-so? And I'll say, I, I, you know, I haven't heard any of his sermons to make an, an, an informed opinion one way or the other. And they just tune me out because I'm not listening to their favorite preacher. I would have figured it would be enough that I'm covered in the blood of Christ, that I don't know him. And I don't know what he teaches, and I'm not making a thing right now, but just the simple fact that I don't know who he is because I don't keep up with brotherhood politics, well, now you're on the outside. You're going to have a bit of that. But now I have to make a transition. You know, people are getting what they're paying for. When they were going into Babylon, it wasn't just the priests. And it's not just the pastor's fault today. In Isaiah 30, verse number 9 and 10, 
that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children of the night, and hear the law of the Lord, which say to their seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, and prophesy deceits. You know, when that lady was talking to me about the Presbyterian church and the homosexuality, she said, the man who opposed the homosexual marriages the most, she said he's got three kids. And she said, he doesn't know if those kids are going to grow up and be practicing homosexuals. Does that matter? I enjoyed her conversation. And I shook her hand, and I told her, thank you for being so nice with me. But she is, in fact, in the category that says, prophesy not unto us right things. If you think that what your kids do determine the truth, you would be telling the prophets in the Old Testament, don't, don't say what God really told you to say. Do what my kids would like you to do. And you know what ends up happening? People, it's just like back then, people who are the biggest donors, who are the biggest tithers, their kids always get a pass because we can't afford to lose them. But that's what people are signing up to do when they join these sectarian groups, speaking to us smooth things. You know, at some point, we can make it where the truth has no value. How could you make it where the truth has no value? You don't tell the truth anymore. You're so worried about soft-soaping it for other individuals because people say, well, they're going to get hurt feelings. It's been my experience that people who get mad, they can be just as happy 45 minutes later. It's not a big deal. So they, they got mad. What are they going to do? Stay mad till they die? They'll get over it. Isaiah 5, number 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. It's the people who are just as much the problem as the priests in the day. Here's what's happening. The membership, we said this two nights ago, the membership doesn't really care. But they don't want to appear unreligious, so they keep paying the priest. And the priest knows that they don't care, but he's glad to get money for nothing. So everybody's really got a silent agreement. And now I have to say this. Everybody knows if they're in that category. It's no mystery. They know exactly who they are. And you say, well, what else are we going to do? You know, there is a church in town that loves to work. There is a church in town that will go out and speak to their neighbors, total strangers. There is a church in town who is dedicated to knowing the book so that we can be ready, 1 Peter 3.15, to give an answer. This is not a secret. And like we said, everybody knows that they're in this category. They don't care, but they don't want to be unreligious, so they just keep paying money so that their conscience is sad. You know exactly if you're in this group and somebody says, well, what's the alternative? You know exactly where the alternative is. It's under this tent and it's at 823 Starling Avenue. Anybody in this town knows that. And someone says, well, I can't believe you have the audacity to say it. Everybody says it. That's how when we go out, people know us by name. When we go to their doorstep, and that's how the police know us in town. You get what you pay for, and this is what you get when you're paying for that type of a system. God, through Amos... The prophet Amos, God said, I hate, I despise your feast days. That was their worship days. He said, I hate your worship days, and I will not smell your solemn assemblies. Though you offer, excuse me, offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, as righteous as a mighty stream. Have you offered me sacrifices and, off and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of Molech, which is an idol, and your images, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus. You get what you pay for, and when you are involved in American sectarianism, where you are openly contradicting the truth, God would say, I hate your worship. Somebody says, I don't know about that. Why? Was, are you going to say that anybody today who would say such is any more brazen than Amos? Amos was giving out God's message. Let me pause here. What am I supposed to do with this? What are you supposed to do with this? You remember how I said that uh, Presbyterian lady, she said she got a creed book in the mail every year? If you go to any of these sectarian groups in town, Baptist, Pentecostal, Apostolic, 
etc. Go in and ask the preacher, do we have a church manual? Do we have a creed book? Do we have a church contract? And if they say yes, say, I'd like to see it. And if they dare show it to you, say, I'd like to make copies of this so that I can compare it with the New Testament text and when you find contradiction between your New Testament text and the practices of your sect, you need to say something, which is what the prophets were saying in their day. What's the solution? Well, I just gave you a piece of it, but now I have to say this. We said this is a liberating lesson. We're almost done. It's a liberating lesson. In 1776, people were saying things like, give me liberty or give me death. Give me, how did that go? Is that right? Give me liberty or give me death? What did it take to get freedom in the 1700s? Some folk had to die. You talking about going out and hurting folk? No. I'm not talking about going out and hurting anybody. I'm talking about the solution is good-minded adults are going to have to start reading more books. <laughs> God forbid. But that's what the answer is. People get books in the mail, and she said, Do I read it? No. She told on herself. And a friend told on herself, do I, do I read when I get in the mail? No. I tell you, I'm hurting my own feelings right now. Because I enjoyed the conversation with her so much, I thought to myself, I'm going to take her a book. I'm going to give her a history book. And she told me, when I get stuff in the mail, don't read it. Oh, well, I'm going to try anyway. What's the solution? We're going to have to read more. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 19. Look at this. When you, Israel, when you are coming to the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, it shall be when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write to him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, and he may, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of the law and the statutes to do them. You hear these people say, I don't need a book to know God. I go walking through the meadow and I know God. Why didn't the king just go walk through a meadow? Because Israel's got plenty of them. The leader of the entirety of the Hebrew nation had to read a book to know the Lord. You today, me today, I have to read a book to know Jesus. And Jesus is not talking to anybody outside of this book today. Small, still voice and all that stuff. That's not happening. Now, here's what some really quote, educated people are going to say to you. These people are going to tell you, Caleb, they didn't have these books like we have today. So how are they going to read and know God? Look at this command to a Hebrew. The Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and you shall teach them diligently to thy children. How is a father going to teach his kids if he don't have the book? He's got to have his own copy of the book. And someone says, how's he going to get a copy of the book? He ain't got a printing press like we do. How'd the king get a copy of the book? Don't you think back then they could have paid a dude to copy the book? <laughs> yeah, I'll copy the book. You want to pay me to copy the book? I'll copy the book. This is not rocket science. And it's in Joshua chapter 4. That this may be a sign among you that when your kids ask the fathers, you will tell them what these stones mean. Well, someone says, that was going to be oral tradition, wasn't going to be in a book. Isn't it something we're reading this out of a book? They had books, y'all. And that's the solution back then. They had to educate themselves. Today we have to educate ourselves. Now, here is our conclusion. What I'm doing tonight is I had to present the sectarian community as divided and problematic. You know, I've got one more story. That lady told me everything about Presbyterian. <laughs> everything about Presbyterians in the town. And someone might say, I'm not a Presbyterian. Are you Pentecostal? Because I met another lady over off Prospect, and she said, I left the last Pentecostal church I was in. And she said, and the pastor was my cousin. That don't make no difference. And I said, amen. It does not matter where your family goes to church. It matters where the truth is being taught. But she told me, she said, in his church, she said, he was adulterous, and he's trying to tell us to live a certain way. She said he made himself have a female assistant, and she said, okay, he's busy, he needs an assistant. 
then she said, but it got to be the point where there was just too much touchy feeling going on to just be an assistant. She said, we all started getting suspicious. And then she said, and you know what? Our suspicions were confirmed. He left his wife, and he got with that girlfriend. And she said, and a bunch of us were just saying, we're not having that. She said, we were already having a problem with it. And she said, you know what happened next? I said, what could happen next? She said, the pastor's own daughter came in and beat the girlfriend in the middle of the aisle in front of everybody in the Pentecostal church. Now, y'all know about it? Did it right in the middle of the aisle. And she said, at that moment, I was out. She said, that's enough for me. It should have been enough when we said adulterous. He's adulterous and he's trying to tell people to live a certain way and it took a fight in the middle of the aisle for some lady to say, even though he's my cousin, I'm out now. Now I tell you what one of my neighbors said. She's Methodist. She said, I'm not going to leave my mess just to be with somebody else's mess. Well, what if there really is a church in town that's dedicated to not having messes go on and just be allowed like so many of the groups are? Here's my point tonight. Here's Jesus' solution. How did a person get to be priest in the Old Testament? They were born into it. You get a bad priest, what can you do? He's a Levite. He's going to be in. You could rebuke him, but that's what so many people say. What can we do? Here's what we do in the New Testament. Christians in the body of Christ, in Acts chapter 6, verse number 3, look at this. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Problem number one with the Presbyterian church, they don't get to pick who does any work inside the Presbyterian sect. There is a national board who tells them what to do. The Baptists are often the same way. The Methodists are the same way. And the disciples of Christ on Broad Street are the same way. When the body of Christ in Martinsville needs something done, we decide who's going to do it. Because we know each other. And we know who's best suited for a certain task. Now, when you have elders, look at this. Elders is an office of work inside the Lord's church. And look at how we decide this. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. We're not going to have elders in this congregation who we don't know. Which means what? Nobody's going to send Bob, Joe, and Ted in and say, let them be elders. We don't know them. We get to decide who we are going to submit to. Now someone says, well, that sounds like prophesy smooth th no we want good teachers we want faithful men we want people of honest report you should be getting to decide who's over you you should know them very well whether or not you want to follow them or not now here's two more passages first peter 5 verses 1 and 3 the elders which are among you i exhort who am also an elder and witness of the sufferings of christ and also partake of the glory that shall be revealed feed the flock of god which is among you take the oversight thereof not by constraint but willingly the people should willingly submit to who the teachers and the elders are going to be. And if you are in a religious system that says, well, we don't have any say who comes in and who goes out, you're in the wrong church because this is how it's designed to be. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. What? That word is example. That's just an old English word. What type of example is it when the pastors are marrying two men? What type of example is it when the pastor is married and has a girlfriend on the side and then his daughter beats her up mid-aisle? Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. It's a big deal being called a pastor because you're answering for the people who you are claiming to follow. And you know what the pastors say about the people that they are actually trying to watch over? Well, they're none of my business. It is your business. Because you're going to give an account for what you try to do for them. That they may do it with joy. There's a bunch of people who call themselves pastors and they hate the people. They're not happy about doing it. And not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You can be religious. You can have a priest. You can have a pastor. And if they're not doing the proper job according to the Bible, nobody's getting any good out of it. And I'm doing all this tonight simply to say there is a better option. And you know what? inside the body of Christ. If the elders aren't being faithful and the elders aren't teaching the word, look at what it says here. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all. You can correct the elders if they need it. Doesn't that sound like the better option? You pick your leaders, you pick them by example, you pick them because they're able to teach, First Timothy chapter 3, 
And in the time that maybe they need to get some correction themselves, faithful men in the congregation can give it to them. We're all trying to help each other in better ways on the right path. Finally, last slide. If you say, that does sound all right. It certainly sounds better than what we got at the moment. What do I need to do to start working with it? Look at this. We talked about the priesthood tonight. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I am a priest in the body of Christ. And if you're a Christian, you're a priest in the body of Christ. So really nobody should be pulling any of these levels on one another. And he says we are a holy nation together. A holy nation. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him unto hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at this. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Same letter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Right before he said on being a holy nation together, look what he said the people had done. They had all been born again. How do you do that? John 3, 5. John, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is just like Mark 16, 16 we saw earlier. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Being a Christian, becoming a Christian, is very simple. And you know, staying a saved Christian shouldn't be nearly as hard as some people think it is. If we consider, I'm saying, the text God has given us the support system God has given us, and the gracious Messiah that we have, you should enjoy being a Christian. And if you don't, we invite you to talk to us tonight. Ask us the questions that you have. You have questions of comparison, that's okay. You have questions about what we said tonight, that's good. We encourage that. But if we can assist you on becoming an actual Christian, a member of the nation, the priesthood, the body of Christ by being born again, this is the time to do it. What we do is Joey's going to come up, he's going to sing a final song, and all you have to do is think about your state with God. Are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? Let's think about it, and this is the process as we stand and as we sing. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I turn. I will hasten to him, hasten so Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Amen. Again, we're thankful for everybody who came out tonight to be a part of this lesson and our worship to God. Uh, before we move any further, we do want to ask if any of our visitors have a Bible question that they want to ask pertaining to the lesson or maybe any comparative questions between the Church of Christ and the man-made sex in the community. Okay. If not, uh, give just an encouraging word. The encouraging word is, if I'm wrong, I'm just wrong. Uh, but I have some heard earlier that it's going to get one day maybe the high of 70-something. So... If, if I'm wrong, I'm at least giving you some false hope to look forward to. But we hope that you can come out tomorrow morning, uh, be here at, at, try to get here around 9. We'll be heading out at 9.30. Like I said, we've got brethren from Texas who are still traveling in. 
So please pray for them. And then tomorrow, sometime in the evening, brethren from Arkansas arriving. And then uh, after that, we still have a family of three coming from Texas. We appreciate all the hard work you're doing. And we've got new blood in. Jenna got here last night. Joshua got in. So everybody's encouraging one another. We really appreciate it. This evening, we're going to ask Ben, our brother, if he would come out and uh, close us in our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this beautiful day. We thank Thee for the encouraging words that we heard this evening uh, from Your Word. We pray that the listeners will take it to heart and obey those words. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the church and all those traveling to be here, and that they we ask that they have safe arrival. Dear Lord, please be with us as we go out into this community and try to spread uh, the seeds of the kingdom and hope that it falls on good ground. Please forgive us when we fall short. In Christ's name, amen.